God bless you, brothers and sisters around the world. I have a message um, that I want to share. It is an opinion. I believe it's biblically based. And I'm going to let you know what I think about what I see going on in the world at the moment. Uh, in terms of church authority and how people are responding, both men and women, submission to authority is like a major problem. Um, I don't know if it's always been this way, but it is definitely this way at the moment. And so I wanted to address it. To submit to someone is to basically humble yourself, right? And I think there's not a, a true Christian in the world that would say they don't submit to the Lord Jesus Christ um, but actually I would beg to differ that many people who call themselves Christians don't submit to him at all and I'd like to explain why so the first thing I want to talk about is about how a man of God like someone who is called uh, as a born-again Christian to serve the Lord in whatever capacity would submit to another man of God, right? There seems to be this uh, delusion, really. Uh, it's obviously satanic, in my opinion, that um, everybody needs to just um, be be their own boss and take no instruction other than directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is fine if you really truly know Him, and He is has like literally instructed you personally to to say or do something I, I totally agree with that but most people do not hear from him that often even if they like to think they do and there are people that know the Lord and hear the Lord much better than other people and they have also been given certain offices right whether they might be a pastor or an apostle a teacher uh, and any of the other offices, um, you know, a prophet isn't someone you might necessarily submit to unless you know that prophecy is of the Lord. And then obviously you know that the Lord was speaking through that person and you submit to what they're saying because they are speaking on behalf of the Lord. But usually we have um, pastors, I would say, like that's the common accepted leadership uh, you know, office that people are agreeable about, like, you know, people are funny about calling people apostles, unless they live in Africa, right? Uh, but in our Western society, if someone was to call themselves an apostle, you might raise an eyebrow. But some people are actually called apostles, right? They are called to be apostles. And there are certain requirements they have to meet in order to do that. Um, one of them is to literally meet the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Another one is that they've planted a church and that they've been sent to do that, like literally sent to do that. And there are other like qualifications for such a thing. Um, they're almost like a pastor of pastors, a bishop if you like, you know. Um, and so ultimately, if there's, a, if there's an army and we know that we are part of the Lord's army, right? There is a kind of hierarchy of authority, even among human beings. And uh, it's, it's humility and it's also discernment to understand who those people might be. And you have to judge people by their fruit, of course. Um, but there are people who don't have any discernment and um, also have a very high opinion of themselves uh, without having the qualifications I just talked about like their own church or a, a ministry at all in fact and you know puff themselves up thinking that they know much more than they do especially the Spirit of the Lord right and so what we have at the moment because of this free-for-all attitude that is on YouTube basically and, and, and other social media platforms is that everybody has an opinion. Anybody can just say whatever they want uh, without seemingly any fear of comeback or regret or uh, you know that they might have to answer one day for their idle words, especially if they were wrong, right? 
And so I want to address this um, very topical situation because I think it's actually going to get even more out of control unless we actually start to talk about it as a church. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. And I'm going to show you a couple of um, messages I sent to someone else. Uh, you know, this has been a, 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 a subject that's been in the works for a while. And I feel it's now time to talk about it. So here they are. Okay, so I was commenting on one of Ray Comfort's uh, videos and it got uh, was quite popular. And then I got a day ago, I got this guy contacting me saying, you hear the voice of the Good Shepherd, but you have a pastor. Earlier on, I said, I talked about my pastor. Uh, he says, something is amiss if Christ is in you. You don't need a pastor and wouldn't want one. I see people quoting these verses a lot. But they are still committing fornication with the whore of Babylon <laughs> in a temple made with hands. When you receive Christ in you, you don't need anyone to teach you, nor would you put any trust in a man. Okay. <laughs> well, this is my response. Yes, it's good to have someone to be accountable to and ask advice from. That's why I also call him one of my best mates, right? one of my best friends i know the lord well but whenever i recognize someone knows him better than i do i consider them an authority would you prefer i call him an apostle instead he meets those qualifications to be called as such humans i look up to and who i consider an authority because they're closer to the lord are those who love deeper than me serve better than me and sacrifice more than me they are also those who have more knowledge than me and hear God's voice clearer than me, right? And then I kind of attacked his pride here a little bit. <laughs> I guess you're someone who doesn't consider anyone above you in anything. And if that's true, I'm very happy for you. And that's actually genuine. If he is, because I don't know who this guy is, right? If he really is someone who has no one above him, he literally will be seated immediately to the right hand of Christ forever. You know, it's like, it's like uh, when... Uh, the Sons of Thunder, uh, two of the disciples, uh, forget their names, uh, were discussing which one's going to be at the right hand of, uh, and at the left hand of the Lord when he's in heaven, right? The most blessed and important place at the wedding feast, right? I would be very happy for anyone who makes it there, you know. Um, brilliant. I'll cheer them because, honestly, they will have heard his voice voice clearer than me they would have had more knowledge than me they would have loved deeper than me they would serve way better than me and sacrifice way more than i do right that is why i would be happy for them they would deserve to be there if they actually end up there right and so his response was i would love to have a companion that hears the voice of the good shepherd understands the scriptures amen every time i think that might happen i find out they're still full of man's wisdom Okay, well, that's an interesting observation then. I mean, you, you can't have too much discernment if that's true. Because all real wisdom comes from the Lord. And if someone really is submitted to the Lord, they will be deeply in the Spirit, understanding the Scriptures uh, clearer and deeper and wider and whatever else. Uh as time goes on until they die right and so to think that someone does know them and then find out they're full of man's wisdom well i understand where he's coming from and that's why those who are ordained as pastors or apostles or whatever else prophets need to have those fruits that that follow uh, the office they say they have right but anyway, he says, my fellowship is truly with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. If your friend is legit, great for you. Yeah, he's legit. Uh, so I said, I personally know several legit men of God who know the Lord better than me. And that is genuine. I don't, I'm not just saying that. I promise you, I know lots of people actually who know the Lord better than me. Does that mean I have nothing to offer them? Because I have less authority in the spirit than them? No because I also have a good relationship with the Lord, and I have been shown different things by him that they may still lack, you see. 
For none of us are perfect, even those who trust the Lord, who the Lord trusts deeply, right? But although in some aspects I can lead others, there are literal offices that some men are appointed to that do not apply to me. I have been called, but they have been chosen. In this regard, I respect the Lord by respecting the office he has given those men, rather than assuming an office out of pride that was never intended as mine. I am neither an apostle or a pastor. And that's where we're at right now. This is, I mean, he didn't reply that, but this is this is what I'm saying. Like, I, you have the choice to listen to my opinion or not. I'm not lording it over you. You have, you can either hear godly wisdom in it uh, uh, and I guess submit to, to what I'm saying because you hear the Lord speaking through it or you go, no, this is man's wisdom like this man has or- already pointed out uh, happens with people who say they're men of God. You could look at what I'm about to say in this video and go, no, this is man's wisdom. I'm going to ignore it, right? You have that choice because I am not proclaiming myself to be a pastor or an apostle uh, as in like I am not lording it over you with like basically wielding an authority in the name of the Lord that you must listen to me right so as you can see we live in a day and age where people want to be their own authority I mean it's probably been like that for a while I would say but it's got worse and especially with the advent of the internet, people even chastise you for, for you wanting to actually submit yourself to another human being that you consider has basically more authority than you in the spirit, right? And they can't work it out, especially if they disagree that person has it. But that is how an army works. And it is not just to do with actual ministry it's also to do in the family environment which is an even bigger contention because people um, really really struggle generally men and women to put to submit to authority that's why a lot of people don't even want anything to do with Christianity whatsoever but even the people who recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate authority really really have a problem First of all, with uh, the leadership of the church, um, I mean, it man- manifests in the in the secular realm to do with politics. Like, like literally, nobody agrees with any politician, really, do they? I mean, they, uh, not not on a on a wide scale, especially in our day and age where they get it so wrong and they seem to be so corrupt, right? But um, in in the church environment there are people who have literally been ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ, chosen, not called, to, like, a bit like the Apostle Paul, you know, he was chosen. He was called, okay, but he was chosen. He was, you know, he was persecuting the church. He was, he was the last person anyone, anyone would have thought God would have chosen to go to the Gentiles and preach the true gospel. Um, But, uh, you know, he was the he was the Jew of all Jews in, in that way. He was a Pharisee of all Pharisees, in his own words, right? And uh, you know, he kept the law to the letter and all of that. So, really, the last person to go to the Jew uh, to the Gentiles, and almost, as far as the Jews are concerned, forsake the law and invite everybody into God's kingdom, right? Um, yet he had. Um, uh, an, an ordination personally by the Lord Jesus Christ and he wrote most of the letters in the New Testament and we know more about his authority uh, in a church setting as, a, as almost like a, a bishop basically than we do about Peter or John or any of those who were actually in the presence of Jesus. I'm not saying they didn't have as much if not more authority but what I am saying is Paul with the um, articulate, educated nature he had, uh, working alongside his revelations to do with what the Lord was showing him about uh, the, the, the kingdom plan and, and how it all fitted together, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Um, you know, he, he took on a, another realm of, the, of authority that he even used against Peter uh, when he saw Peter and Barnabas being hypocrites when, when they were 
slyly going back to being uh, Jews in, in Acts, is it 10? Somewhere like that. Um, you know, Paul was the one who rebuked them, right? And that is an authoritative move, especially in front of the whole church. Yet this guy wasn't nearly walking with the Lord Jesus Christ as long as they were, right? But other than ministry, there is this issue of the family environment where, yes, Christ is the uh, is submitted to God, but we are submitted to Christ as men. Um, but women, um, not all women, but when you get to the bare bones of it, and I've, I've got a feeling this is going to be unpopular now, but it needs to be said, right? There seems to be this massive disconnect um, where people have always um, said one thing and done another, you know, like it, 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 it's because they want to do it, but they can't. And the reason is always demonic, in my opinion. It, it, it's not I that does it, it's the, the flesh, that you know, sin living in me that does it, right? Um, but that's still no excuse. And ultimately, this has got to be addressed because I'm seeing all over the place, wives especially, um, listening to that serpent whisper in the ear, ear that, uh, you know, the man of God might be wrong. That, that you know, the man of God that they serve. Look, it's different if your husband, for example, is not a man of God, right? But if they are a man of God, then you absolutely have to do what he says. You have to listen to him. And that is a really hard pill for a lot of women to take because ultimately it is uh, against what has become cultural now. And um, it's almost like we're trained uh, to think that it's just a free-for-all, willy-nilly, let's just do whatever we want. Um, but it's not actually like that in the church, as I've already pointed out. Um, but whenever someone doesn't submit to someone else when they should, it's always a sign of disrespect. And um, that lack of authority um, uh, that isn't being upheld as well is also like um, for the sake of comfort or ease or whatever else whereas as men of God like I'd literally you know Paul recommends in the King James at least that if you have a wife be as though you have none that's a hard saying isn't it but that is scripture um, and ultimately, if someone's going to nag you to death and, and uh, try and get their own way coercively, then it's better just to be on your own in the desert or, you know, wherever that proverb says, like a nagging wife, you know, it's better just to be on your own. Listen, I'm not pointing any fingers, um, but generally speaking, um, that disrespect comes from pride because if you really are truly humbling yourself not just before the Lord but before um, those who should be an authority over you whether they are an apostle or a pastor or your husband um, and that's not happening you definitely know that you are dealing with uh, uh, the issue of pride um, which is always an evil spirit I think most people would agree with that and so that's where we're at right now and it needs to be addressed in my opinion because it's the cause of a lot of discontent and a lack of peace um, in the household it does negatively affect your children if you have children they are very perceptive they will pick it up you know and any woman's disrespect for her husband by not actually obeying him when he needs to be obeyed and this is the thing like culture would say well why should I obey him I'm my own person whatever right well if you really truly believe he's a man of God and that he is submitted to God and he's listening to God why would you question it why why would you question that surely there's a serpent whispering in your ear somewhere right and you're in agreement with it and actually that's rebellion so in this biblical story in 1 Chronicles 21 Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel, right? As it says in the King James. 
And David said to Joab and the rulers of, of the people, Go number Israel from uh, Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord, the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And then we know they took the census and David realized he sinned. And then the consequences were dire for Israel, right? And elsewhere in 2 Samuel, we know it's the anger of the Lord that provoked the whole uh, situation. And uh, David's pride was used as judgment against Israel. Now, the thing is, Joab here, even though he is submitted to David's authority as uh, a leader in the army uh, that David is the king of, he does make a, an appeal, really, to David to say, why? Why why do you want to do this? Why do you want to bring a curse on yourself? Because if you look at Exodus uh, 30, verse 12, When thou shalt take the sum of the children of Israel according to their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. Thing was, Israel didn't belong to David, it belonged to the Lord. And you were only able to uh, take account, take stock of something that actually belonged to you. And I think this is why the Lord was angry with David for actually carrying out uh, something that uh, was ultimately inspired by the adversary, or uh, Hasatan, as it says. More than likely, it was the actual evil one, wasn't it? Let's face it. Um, but the Lord used um, Satan to bring judgment against Israel, and also to reveal David's pride in a kind of chastising way. And obviously, David had to face some very hard choices uh, as to what what the judgment was going to be obviously he wanted to fall into the hands of the lord rather than his uh, physical enemies on earth so he did choose the plague and a lot of people died but he didn't listen to joab's advice and joab still went and carried out his instructions even though he knew it was wrong and that's the point as i've pointed out already um the situation with David and Joab, when Joab disagreed with David that they should take a census, for example, and in other uh, um, occasions where, you know, Joab didn't quite think David had it, his head on straight when he was making these decrees as a king, right? It always ended, well, not always, but a lot of the time it ended badly. Um, and, you know, in the census example, thousands of people died because of David's bad decisions and not listening to good advice. Um, there, there were other occasions where people, uh, kings, especially of Israel, neglected to listen to advice and then lost the respect of entire people groups because they could have lightened the load of certain people um, when they actually decided to tighten the, um, the noose, if you like, that there uh, could have been a, a, a people winner and they would have served that king much harder but because he pushed them so hard they just completely rebelled and went their other way right there are times when to uh, take um, a rebellious stance against uh, God-given authority is really going to damage you um, obviously that ended with Israel being divided even more lots of wars and things like that people killed and ultimately that king, I forgot which one it is, is it Rehoboam? Um, you know, pretty much lost uh, a large portion of his army and and those who could work the land and all sorts because they just did their own thing in northern Israel there. So this happens on a, 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 a microcosmic scale within the family. If there is discontent between you because that wife is not showing respect for the man of God who's in charge of the household, by obeying him and doing what he says and not submitting. Um, even when they know that 
if they submit, that man of God is liable for his own actions, like David was. It wasn't Joab who had to face the consequences for David taking the census, because he was the one who was against it. And even though he went around all Israel and did what David commanded, it was David who was responsible. And that's the point, right? Like, if you really do believe your husband is a man of God, and even if you disagree with his decision, you've just got to go with it anyway, because he's the one who's going to reap the um, reap the consequences if he's wrong. But you have to trust whether he's listening to the Lord or not. And you have to have a good reason to believe that he doesn't hear from the Lord before you even back chat or come back with something else that isn't, you know, in my opinion, of God. Um, because to to question anything, especially in a, a Jezebelic way, I'm going to use that word, Jezebelic way, rebellious, um, manipulative way to get what you want and, and have your way, that's going to end badly for you. And the church needs to really, really embrace the fact, not only on the leadership scale, but on the familial scale as well, like the, the, within the family. Um, women of God are going to have to start knowing their place a bit more uh, if they truly believe their husband is a man of God who's hearing from God. And I'll give you a couple more examples now. So the next example I thought of was uh, from Jesus himself. And at this point, obviously, he hadn't been glorified uh, in the crucifixion and ascension. Uh, this is John 6, where he said that he is the bread of life and uh, that anyone who believes on him will have everlasting life. And he said this to the Jews, of course. Um, he's the living bread. And they strove among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And then Jesus comes out with a, a very hard saying, as, as it says, as they said, you know, he that eateth my flesh, drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me and I in him. Uh, and many, therefore, of his disciples, right? His actual disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, right? That's an interesting word to use, isn't it? Does this offend you? And then he goes into spiritual truths here. Words of spirit and life. But there are people there who would betray him. There were a lot of disciples here. Um, and they left. They went back, walked no more with him, right? Because of that hard saying. And then even the 12 were like, well, who are we going to go to? After Jesus said, will you go away? Uh, they knew he had the words of eternal life, but they didn't say, hang on a minute. This isn't hard. It, they knew it was hard saying that we, they, you know, I, I've literally been accused of being a vampire because I feast on the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ and drink the blood, right? Uh, in order to be a part of his kingdom and what he's doing to receive eternal life. And obviously, you know, before anybody knew who Jesus really was, um, other than the signs and wonders that he was doing, someone saying that kind of thing is very hard. Yet, the point I'm trying to make here is that the true disciples, even though it was a very hard saying that made most people leave, basically were like, well, you've got the words of eternal life. We know that, right? And they submitted to something that was beyond their comprehension at that point. So another area of submission I think the church is really missing generally as a whole at the moment is to do in prayer. And obviously that's a big topic for me. Anyone who knows my YouTube channel knows that prayer is an essential thing. And I'm actually probably going to make a, a longer video at some point when I get a chance. But to, to nutshell it, there is an element of authority, excuse me, um, to wearing a head covering as a woman when you pray and not wearing anything on your head when you're a man as you pray or prophesy, right? Very clear in scripture. Now I can hear a lot of women protesting that their hair is 
uh, a head covering, and so I'm going to address that now. In the NASB Bible, the words cover and uncover are used six times in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's a few snippets that illustrate this. Every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For if a woman does not cover her head, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? But the debate over what the covering is comes later in verses 14 and 15. Let's read that now. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, no one disputes that what Paul's talking about here in these two verses is hairless. That's clear. Men are to have short hair, and women are to keep their hair longer than men's. What's debated is how this passage relates to the rest of Paul's argument about covering. Those who would advocate a cloth or an artificial head covering would say, Paul in this passage is appealing to what nature teaches us about her hair lengths as a reason for why women should use an artificial covering. The other side says, no, this isn't a reason, it's an explanatory passage on what the covering is. It shows that Paul was concerned with hair lengths all along. So, which one is it? I'd like to give you five reasons why I believe Paul is speaking about an artificial covering when praying or prophesying. Reason number one. In verse 15, the Greek word for covering is a completely different word than what was used in the rest of the chapter. Now, do you remember how I said the words cover or uncovered are used six times in 1 Corinthians 11? Let's take a look at the first five of those references. But every woman who has her head, a katakalotos. For if a woman does not kataka looped over her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her kataka looped over her head. For a man ought not to have his head kataka looped over. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head a katakala toss? Okay, so we just looked at five of the six references for cover and uncover. And we saw that when Paul refers to a covering, he calls it kataka looped over. And uncovering, a katakala toss. It's the same Greek word, but the latter is in the negative. Now let's look at the last reference to covering, which comes from verse 15. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, is a glory to her? For her hair is given to her for a peribalion. Huh. So even though English versions of the Bible translate both words as covering, Paul differentiates between the two by using a completely different Greek word. In the one verse where he's clearly talking about hair lengths, he calls the covering a peribalion. Whereas in the rest of the chapter, when he talks about how women are to worship, he uses kataka lupo. So if verse 15 was an explanatory verse, and Paul was actually talking about hair lengths all along, wouldn't he have called a woman's long hair kataka lupo? Reason number two. If long hair was the only covering mentioned in this chapter, then there's a major problem with verse 6. Let me show you what I mean. If long hair was the same as being covered according to Paul, what would be being uncovered? It would be having short hair, right? The opposite of covered is uncovered, and the opposite of long hair is short hair. So if that's what Paul had in mind, let's do some word replacement in verse 6, where we see the words cover her head, let's replace that with have long hair. For if a woman does not have long hair, let her also have her hair cut off. Let's look at that again in another Bible translation. For if a wife will not have long hair, then she should cut her hair short. If you refuse to have long hair, you should cut your hair short, but you'd already have short hair. The argument wouldn't make any sense. He has to be talking about an artificial covering. Reason number three. Paul is only concerned with covering during specific times. He says in verses 4 and 5, Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. He makes it clear he's not talking about what happens all the time, he's talking about what happens at a specific time. This is about what one wears on their head when they're engaged in worship acts. So the very fact he limits the covering to specific times hints that he has a removable covering in mind. This is something you can put on and take off, not what is permanent, like our hair. Reason number four. In verse 15, a woman's long hair is called her glory, whereas earlier in verse 10, Paul says a woman is to wear a symbol of authority on her head. The fact that these two purposes are antithetical shows us that more than one covering is being discussed. One is natural, the other artificial. One permanent, the other removable. One is a glorious thing, the other is symbolizing submission to authority. Reason number five. Finally, the fact that the church unanimously understood Paul to mean an artificial covering until recent times is a very strong point. We're talking about 1900 years of history with the church all saying the same thing. And the attestation to head covering being artificial rather than long hair is really early. For example, Tertullian, right, only 150 years after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 11, said that the church in Corinth was still practicing veiling in his own day. He said, so too did the Corinthians themselves understand him. In fact, at this day, the Corinthians do veil their virgins. What the apostles taught, their disciples approved. Clement of Alexandria, writing around the same time, said, Woman and man are to go to church decently attired, for this is the wish of the word, since it is becoming of her to pray veiled. And Hippolytus said, Let all the women have their heads covered with an opaque cloth. So in light of the witness of church history, the differentiation in Greek words, the verse 6 problem passage, the fact that covering is only for a specific time, and that covering is a symbol of authority, not her glory, it's best to understand Paul saying that women are to have long hair, but during times of worship, they're to cover it with a veil. Now, it doesn't just stop at head coverings, because uh, in one of the letters of Timothy, Paul talks about how women should be modest in apparel, you know, not drawing attention to themselves, their hairstyles, or wearing jewellery in a, in a seductive way, a brazen way, a worldly way. Yet this seems to be predominant in the church. We break and divide every demonic confederacy against the election, against America, against that who you have declared to be in the White House. We break it up in the name of Jesus. We lose confusion into every demonic confederacy directed right now at this election, directed specifically at the six states. We come against people that are working at high levels right now with demonic confederacies and secrecies and demonic plans and networks. We break it up and we command that it be exposed right now in the name of Jesus. Strike and strike. The angels have even been dispatched from Africa right now. Africa right now. Africa right now. From Africa right now. They're coming here. They're coming here. In the name of Jesus from South America. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. From Africa. From South America. Angelic forces. Angelic reinforcement. Angelic reinforcement. Angelic reinforcement. Pika, hata, anda, ata, orabata, 
Maranatha and Ek Ekamanda Rasata. For I hear the sound of victory. 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 I do understand that women are trying to attract uh, 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 a husband especially a man of God if they love God right um, but that is totally the wrong way to go about it uh, because it's always going to end in tears and also you have to understand that if that's something that you think is going to make you more attractive you got entirely the wrong end of the stick if you think uh, you know spiritual men see that kind of thing and and um, are attracted by it. It's actually the opposite. Um, Paul goes on in, the, in that same letter saying, you know, what really makes women attractive is their modesty, their, you know, their humility, the fact that they will listen and submit. And I would say that a lot of women say they would do that and they really don't. And that's, that's one of the reasons why a household is probably very divided and even when Jesus said the house will be divided I mean that could possibly be a reason because if that man of God is submitted to Jesus and you as a wife um, thinks that they should be doing it different or they're you know and you're making a stand against that with no real biblical reason other than it's just you know you don't like it that contention is going to fester and cause bitterness and rebellion and it could even be something you would lose your soul over actually which is why i feel the need to bring it up because uh just on a general basis there have been several examples lately where i've had to counsel both men and women in this regard um, and ultimately the reasons are that whoever is the problem does not fear God enough and will not submit and, hum and humble themselves, basically. That, those, are, those are the two reasons. I mean, they're linked, obviously. Uh, if you're not gonna humble yourself and submit to authority, you don't fear God, right? Um, even if you believe that person's wrong, you need a very good biblical reason and you need to bring it before the church. You don't try and resolve it yourself you know? now of course in our day and age there are lots and lots of different christian denominations and youtube ministries and people rise rising up as leaders uh, as, as far as they're concerned they're leaders and um one of the reasons for that is people seem to um everybody wants to be a chef no one wants to be the waiter you know uh everybody wants that position of leadership they want to be the vicar, the rector, the priest, you know, they want to come and exalt really themselves among everybody else, be the general, whatever it looks like, right? Now, what that actually means is everybody comes to faith by a personal experience of some type. That's what it means to be born again. The Lord will literally deal with you, hopefully on a personal basis. And if it isn't on a personal basis, I would question whether it really is a legit born again experience, right? Um, but after that, you start to look into different people. They help you. You get revelation. You understand things. And when that happens, you kind of uh, divert into different camps and you go, oh, I like this preacher. I don't like that preacher, whatever, right? And you start to follow different people. But the thing is, if there's lasting fruit from one particular person uh, who is in a legit leadership under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and you have benefited from it, really in some kind of way you are now um, linked to that ministry. And then if you decide later down the line that you are in a disagreement and you don't have uh, a real reason other than you're just puffing yourself up and you're taking something someone else said who you now value and bringing it against that ministry that helped you in the first place you have now lifted yourself above their authority even though 
um, by very definition, those people had an authority over you by default just because they helped you in the faith, right? I mean, for example, Paul said to, was it Onesimus? I can't remember, or Epaphroditus maybe. Or, oh no, it was um, the chap who uh, lost his servant. Well, I think it was Onesimus, right? And Paul basically said, you owe me your life. You know that. I'm not going to mention it, but I'm going to mention it. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, not to say you owe me one, basically, because I'm your father in the faith, basically. There is a legitimate reason to be able to say something like that and not be prideful. Because if that person brought you to like a knowledge of the truth, you owe them your so you owe them your soul at some level right if you had never heard that message what would have happened you would have carried on in the world maybe maybe you would have heard someone else maybe the lord would have used someone else but then you would have owed them right and if you came against them that's a problem because later down the line to uh you know like a like an angsty teenager come against your own parents you know even if they're just spiritual parents if you like no one gets any credit at the end of all of this except the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all just servants. It doesn't matter if you're an apostle or, I don't know, the, the old lady who prays in the temple night and day, um, like that lady who prophesied it, that over the Messiah, you know, when, he first, when she first saw him as a baby in the temple, right? On paper, even the, the, the widow who put the widow's mite in, her lasting fruit throughout eternity wasn't noticed by anybody else then except Jesus um, and he had to point it out to his disciples how precious that was to him for her to put everything she had into the temple treasury um, but on the surface most people would have gone yeah that's nothing I just gave a million dollars you know um, these little things that everything comes down to motive and everything uh, that is spiritual really is kind of hidden in a way. People are great actors and can be very, very disingenuous even when other people can't see it. And God knows all of our motives and he knows whether you resent or are bitter against or are tr subtly trying to subvert or putting your nose into affairs that sh you're, you shouldn't put your nose into or whatever else, right? And ultimately, that's gonna backfire if you don't like see it for what it is and repent of it and submit to an authority and as a woman and this is going to be a very unpopular thing to say as a woman you will always have an authority over you as long as there are men who love God in this world and want to serve him right uh, there, there will always be a leader uh, either a, an apostle or a pastor or maybe if you're married and you're married to a man of God that's ultimately your first primary authority, uh, you know, immediate authority, because he is led by the Lord. And you need to assume that if he is submitted to God, everything that comes out of his mouth is basically through the fear of God, trying to imitate how he's actually being led by the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And Paul does tell us that women can be very easily deceived, right? He said Eve, Eve was deceived, right? And, and that's a good reason women shouldn't teach or preach in a church situation. Yet the, the, the position we're in at the moment is that everybody is very rebellious. There are even uh, Ahab men uh, who say they love God who, you know, applaud women standing up in church and preaching. And if you've noticed anything about those particular type of women, they have talons, they usually have like a lot of makeup on, gold earrings, short hair, very fancy dress, you know. Um, it's all symbols of something way, way deeper that anyone with discernment should recognize immediately. So in the area of submission, it all comes down to motive and are you really submitted to the Lord? Most people would say, I am, but if, I've, if anything I've said right now has convicted you, then you need to repent because you haven't been submitted to the Lord. He is the one who orchestrates authorities, rulers, dominions, powers, 
and he has orchestrated the hierarchy um, within humanity as well and men will always have that authority over women in that sense and that was ordained right at the start in the garden um, you know you shall you shall want to have authority over your husband but he will rule over you and that has been a decree from God since the start right because even though Adam was responsible really for the fall um, because Eve ate first the thing is Eve was deceived and she ate first and then she gave it to her husband right and in an in a in a moment of madness he forgot what God or, or ignored at least what God said to him right and that's why we're in this mess <laughs> so I hope this has been helpful I genuinely don't want to upset people uh, or offend people but it, it if it is the offending you hopefully it's the gospel and not me um, I know some things are very unpopular to be said but it's got to the point where some things just need to be said and that's where we're at right now so God bless you have a good day and I pray that um, you will at least meditate about what I'm saying if nothing else all right God bless